ahead and get started here. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Michael Cooper, CCS Interactive. We're a digital marketing agency and computer training facility, but I'm also a giant nerd. And so I love AI. I've loved AI ever since I was a little kid. I used to watch Star Trek The Next Generation, and there's a character on there named Data, who's an Android. It's hooked ever since. Um, and that actually is an inspiration partly for what I want to present to you a little bit today, because I, being this little kid, have this mind that, okay, well, AI is going to become artificial. Right? It's going to be these things you see in movies like Terminator, you see in Matrix and all that. And I look, I'm not ashamed to say I'm a little disappointed it's not. Right? So I, I have investigated it pretty deeply. I've gotten some intuition about the math um, so that I can explain it to you in a way that you can understand what it really is, what it really is, and what are some of the things that it can do. Um, a couple of people need handouts. Okay, so naturally, we get most of our information about AI from Hollywood. Right? We've all seen these movies. I mentioned them before, Matrix, which with the younger folks, a lot of them don't even know what that movie is anymore, which is crazy, right? So, to, you know, robots turning humans into batteries, or Terminator you know, wiping out human beings and all these kinds of things. And there's some genuine concern about it. I do want to be clear. We should never plug AI into the nukes. Okay, <laughs> never. And that's not even really a joke. Like, we never should. Is it ever going to be Skynet? I personally don't think so. Is it Skynet now? Most definitely not. But why tempt fate, right? There's so many great sci-fi novels and things out there. There's absolutely no reason for us to take any sorts of risks with AI. And I'll explain some reasons why. So what we're going to talk a little bit about today, I'm going to start by giving you some background about artificial intelligence, what it is, what it is not, what it does particularly well, right? And that pertains very much to you as business people. Um, what are the issues with it? What are some of the limitations? What are the implications for the web? That's very much my world, right? SEO and digital marketing, all those kinds of things. Obviously, it's changing that landscape quite a bit. And most importantly, the biggest reason you're probably here is what's in it for you. And that sheet I just handed out has a lot to do with it. This is just a tiny sample of all of the AI products that are out there. And by the end of this conversation, there will probably be 25 more. Okay. So AI is just math. And I know that probably causes a lot of people a headache anyway, right? Because math isn't super sexy. But that's really all that it is. In fact, it's not even that complicated. Under the hood, it's actually pretty simple arithmetic most of the time. But what's different about it is the scale. So we have not just one little equation, but billions, trillions of equations that are computing. And this is, allows us to form really complex relationships. Machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. And what that means is we don't necessarily teach the machine how to do anything at all. We just say, OK, well, here's Here's something to start with. Here's some data. Here's a conclusion you should draw from that data. We're going to run you through some cycles, and you're going to figure it out on your own, right? So machine learning is a process where we really don't know how everything is happening in between. We just know here's our input. Here's our output. We've spent a lot of time curating our data set so that we know exactly why this data should result in this outcome. And then we let the computer figure out how best to get from point A to point B. Supervised and unsupervised are two major categories of learning. So the unsupervised means we don't actually necessarily know what the outcome is going to be. So think something like Netflix, where you've watched a bunch of shows, and now they're suggesting shows to you based on what you've already watched. This is an example of unsupervised, meaning this machine doesn't actually know what the outcome should be or exactly how it should form all these relationships. But what it can do is given millions of people, I suppose even billions with Netflix, their data on what they've watched, what they've liked, what they've hit the little thumbs up sign on, and how those things kind of line up with other people that have done similar things. So they can say, okay, well, we have a group of people over here that like this one show, and then they really like this one. So let's suggest that show to this other person who also liked this other show that everybody liked. So this is an example of unsupervised learning. Supervised is where we specifically know the outcomes that we want. So a lot of the algorithms that I'm going to show you today, or the models, I should say, that I'm going to show you today, we ahead of time had some really good data going in. So like imagery data, right? Images of cats. And then we label these images. We say this image has a cat in it, or this image has a dog in it, or this image has a table in it. And we have maybe millions or billions or even trillions of these images that have been labeled ahead of time by a lot of human labor. And we feed them all through this machine, 
so that it correctly predicts as much as possible the correct labels for particular images based on the data we gave it, right? We train it on data that we curated, but the whole point is to release it on data that it's never seen before and get as accurate an outcome as we possibly can. It's very opaque to us, and I kind of described that earlier, where we really don't know what's going on in between. We know what's going in, we know what's coming out, we can see all of the numbers that have been formed, and you could really go in there and dive and see all that stuff if you really wanted to, but it's going to be completely meaningless to you. We have no idea exactly how relationships are encoded inside. So that's part of what makes it a little scary. And there are techniques that we can use to get some intuition about what's going on. But most of these models, especially something like ChatGPT, there's, we really don't understand. We know the algorithm, we set everything up, we engineered everything, but exactly what all of these points that are connected together inside that space, anybody's guess what's really going on there. The most important thing for you to understand is that almost all AI is really just a prediction machine. So in the case of ChatGPT, we might be tempted to think that it's thinking or that it understands the way we do, the way we do in our brains. It is nothing like our brains whatsoever. There's a, a concept called neural nets. If you've heard of neurons in your brain, right? And so neural networks are a big subset of all the AI that's making the buzz right now. But the name is really where the association ends. The idea that you have these little neurons that connect to each other billions of different ways, that's where the association ends. AI is nothing like our brains. It is not going to be anytime soon. It probably won't ever be, in my opinion. But we have to be careful about saying never, right? But I seriously doubt it will ever be as sophisticated as a human brain. But there are some interesting technologies that I can nerd out with you later and tell you about that are maybe going in that direction. So it could happen. It's, I won't close the door on it, but it's definitely not happening in the next 10 years. So what does AI do well? It processes huge amounts of data. This is really one of the ways it's most useful for us. So an example would be all of the telescopes that are going out and taking pictures of the sky they need AI to process this information because it doesn't look like a normal digital picture. It doesn't look like an image you can really make any sense of. So you have to process it using AI to pull together all of these data points to combine it into a single image that we can make some sense of. Like uh, fairly recently, we flew by Pluto, right? We probably saw a lot of the really beautiful images out of Pluto. Well, that wasn't just one picture that was taken. That's lots of images that have been composited together. <laughs> It's really, really good at repetitive tasks. And this is where it's going to be really useful for you to take things off of your plate. Mundane, annoying things that you have to do that take up a lot of your time. You can use AI to help you. And sometimes you can just use a process called automation to help you. And automation is somewhat related to AI, but strictly speaking, isn't exactly the same. So you could think of something like a CRM, customer relation management software, where you're automating responses and, and those kinds of things, scheduling things. If you haven't heard from a contact in five days, send them a little note bug them and say, hey, I just wanted to check on that proposal I sent you. That's an example of automation. It's really great at categorizing and sorting. So I mentioned Netflix already. Any kind of product where we have tons of data and we want to make some sense out of it. So say, for example, you've got all this data that you've collected on your potential customers and you want to find 10, you want to drop them into 10 groups so that you can come up with 10 individual marketing strategies. So you can use a model to self-sort all of these people by their relative similarity. Similarity, and that's a little bit like geometry in a way. Again, it's just it's just kind of math. Um, recognizing patterns. This is probably one of the places it's most useful to us. And I think a way that it's making a, a lot of waves right now is in the medical industry. So if we can actually read scans and detect you know things like cancer early, patterns that we can't necessarily perceive ourselves visually, but they exist in there in the data, and machines can actually help find things or or help us with diagnosis. Computer vision is a space where it really has changed a lot, especially in the last 20 years. Computer vision has to do with being able to look at images or video and make sense of them. So I, I gave that cat example. When you study any machine learning like I went through, they always start with cats. The internet is completely obsessed with cats, as you probably know, right? So it, it has to go, uh, it started with being able to label whether or not an image has something. And it's now advanced on to being able to put an image into one of these things and it will describe in rich detail everything about it, all of the little details, things about the background and all kinds of things. Um, so that's a very interesting, that's a space I actually work in quite a bit too, that's having to do with security, trying to detect things on security cameras so we can take a lot of work off of security personnel. Um, navigation, of course, we all use navigation, right? GPS, finding routes, uh, things like, you know, UPS or FedEx planning their routes as effectively as possible for maximum efficiency or whatever their various kinds of desirables are. But most importantly, it enables you to focus on higher order tasks.
So what's different now? Um, you, you might be surprised to know that AI has actually been around since the 50s. It's not new. I know it's getting all this buzz right now. And there are some genuinely new things that I'll briefly describe. But many of the techniques that are at work here have been around uh, since the 50s and 60s. Again, it's just math. But it's math being done on a tremendous scale. So one of the things that's definitely changed, of course, is computer power, right? Not so long ago, dating myself a little bit, we all had single core processors, right? Now every processor you get has multiple cores on it. We have these things can do so much more than a full-on desktop that you probably paid a couple grand for in the 90s. This can do so much more, which is, you know, they sent us to the moon with a computer about as sophisticated as a calculator, right? So computing power has changed tremendously, and that's a big reason why we actually have a lot of new techniques today. But again, the math behind them probably been around a lot longer than you think. Um, there are some genuinely newer techniques, though. I mentioned computer vision. Um, so convolution is a, is a concept that was introduced roughly 20 years ago that really, really upped the ante on computer vision, made them so much more accurate when they're able to label things. Um, another one would be an attention mechanism, which is really what's behind the ability for us to use things like ChatGPT. So this has to do with sequential types of models, right? We need to spit out one word at a time, or we need to spit out audio over time. We need to analyze video. An attention mechanism allows us to bypass this issue of uh, a model being so hyper-focused on whatever frame it's processing or whatever second of audio it's processing at that exact moment. Attention mechanisms allow it to understand everything that came before, everything that's coming after, the big picture. And a subset of these is now transformers. That's the T part of GPT. Transformers have allowed us to create context. You can now have algorithms that can understand huge amounts of information all at once from a big picture, rather than just doing it one little piece at a time, the way that we were limited to up until about 2017. But really the biggest thing that's changed, we live our lives online. now. There is so much data available. A lot of it we probably wish wasn't that we put out there before we realized that it was going to get, you know, scooped up by all of these companies. But there's now so much image data, text data, everything is online and digitized, right? We can actually have books online instead of just be having to be scanned from a library book, right? There's so much data out there that these algorithms can now digest. So between the computing power, a couple of new techniques, and the fact that we're all completely addicted to our phones and our computers, we have some pretty amazing products coming in. So what are some of the issues with it? Definitely over promise. So you might be surprised to hear as much of an enthusiast as I am, I'm actually putting the brakes a little bit on this. Let's not get too much over excitement about what these things really can do. There are a lot of products, even some that I plan to show you today, where once I started playing with them, eh, I wasn't quite as good as they said on their little landing page, right? Little limitations. So we have to be careful that we don't think that they can do more than it really can. And you really do want to be careful about people that are trying to sell you their A product, whether AI product, whether or not it's really as good as they say. Um, there's also an issue with nuance. If you think about it, what these models are really doing is they're oversimplifying the world, right? And, and we do that too as humans, right? We take in our information, we develop our mental picture of what's going on in the world, and necessarily we're going to take shortcuts. Um, but we're still a little bit better at nuance and intuition. These things, not so good. They cut corners. They're, they're only as good as the information that's gone into them. If there's information that they've never seen before, then that's not going to be incorporated into the, their output. So they're really not very good at nuance. And that's why I say, don't hook them to the nukes. Don't put them in a position to be able to autonomously kill a human being because their decision-making authority may be pretty impressive, but 97% of the time being right, when you're dealing with people's lives, that 3% makes a pretty big difference, right? And so coming back to overpromise, we've had the self-driving cars and all these things, right? We were supposed to have all this self-driving stuff way back then, right? And we're supposed to have it now, and it's still not there. And there, there's all kinds of regulation and, and scrutiny into the various people that are putting out these kind of products. Because you know what? Not hitting 99 out of 100 pedestrians is not acceptable, right? And so getting to 100% with these things is actually tremendously challenging. It's really because they don't handle nuance very well. Um, so regulation and enforcement. And it, it's a little bit of the Wild West right now. So if you're concerned about it, I encourage you to get involved in the conversation. If you know people that are policymakers or connected to policymakers, make sure you're putting pressure on them to make this a bigger deal. But to be honest, the cat's a little bit out of the bag. It's not entirely clear 
how we really could rein in some of these private companies that can do this technology, especially because you can do it on your home computer now. I have a tremendously powerful GPU that I use for my uh, gaming system that can now do what it took uh, a warehouse full of machines to do 10 years ago. So anybody can do it now. And people with significant means, companies or, or nations with significant means, can do some pretty powerful things. And what can we really do to stop it? Privacy and data ownership, definitely one of the biggest issues, right? So again, it's not going to wipe us out necessarily, but we do have to be concerned about the ways it's disrupting our world. And the recent actor strikes, for example, one of the big issues was, uh, and the writers as well, was the ability for uh, these models to use their likeness. Did everybody hear about the Scarlett Johansson thing a couple of days ago? Right? So these are big things. And again, nobody stopped them. She said, no, you cannot use my voice. They did it anyway, right? So if we don't have control, we live in a free society where we can put pressure on open AI to say, no, you can't do that, but we can't necessarily put that pressure on our adversaries. One of the biggest issues though really is gonna be cost. So you might be thinking, okay, they just came out with ChatGPT 4 recently. There's a new version Omni I'm gonna show you in a minute. 4.5 is rumored to be coming out in the summer. So that must mean there's gonna be a five and a six and a seven. Yeah, maybe not because they're already saying that creating GPT-5, the plans they have for it, the scale, requires absurd amounts of energy, absurd amounts of money. And they're concerned that they're not gonna be able to charge enough for it to earn back what they've invested into it. And then it's already gonna become obsolete. And make no mistake, GPT, it's all the rage right now, not gonna be around forever because something better is gonna come along. In fact, OpenAI is cooking something right now they call QSTAR, which is supposed to be the next level using a slightly different technique even than GPT. So will we see a GPT-6 or a 7? Maybe not. Probably not. Implication for the web, um, search, right? And it, in a positive way, you're now starting to see search results where they're, they've been generated by Gen AI, right? They appear up at the top. Has anybody seen that yet, right? And so now you're not even necessarily clicking into a website that has that information. You're getting the answer that you're looking for summarized right there. Maybe it gives you a couple of citations, but maybe you don't even bother to click on it. You're satisfied with the answer you receive. So that's gonna have big implications for people in my world because now their traffic might be going way down. Um, but one real upside here is, of course, you've, you've probably heard of keywords, right? Keywords are king. But now it's really more about the subject matter. Is what you're talking about closely related to what somebody searched for, even if you didn't use any of the words that they searched for. This is a capability that Gen AI now has. So now you're gonna to have to switch your focus to really high quality content, making sure that your subject matter is concise, well-conceived, well-supported, because that's what's gonna elevate you. Because the algorithms that are doing all of this cataloging are gonna care about the quality of your content, not just that you use the word SEO 1500 times on one page. That used to work in the early 2000s. People did that, it was called keyword stuffing. It doesn't work anymore. These companies are getting smarter because they want all of us who use the product to have a better experience. So I would say that's generally an upside, but it does make tricking the system a little bit harder for us. Um, and I already mentioned Gen AI summaries. Um, SEO and content origins, again, I kind of already discussed. It has to do with the fact that the quality of your content is gonna matter more than whether or not you've stuffed it with the right keywords. Um, customer service is another really interesting one. So obviously we're not all available to answer the phone or answer our email 24 seven, but you're seeing a lot more interest now in chatbots. And those aren't specifically new, right? We've had chatbots for a while, but if you've used them, they've probably been pretty frustrating, right? Pretty annoying, very, very limited. Things like they give you little buttons that you can choose, various little tasks that they have, but you can't ask a general purpose question. You can't ask it to do something it wasn't programmed to do. Well, that's just not true anymore. Now with these things being able to plug into something like ChatGPT or Gemini or you know, Microsoft, then uh, you're actually gonna be able to get answers that are human, that are understandable, that you can translate into a dozen or many dozens of languages 24 seven around the clock. You can get these things to actually schedule appointments for people and gather information and get that into your CRM if you need to around the clock. And really provide meaningful service in a way that's not quite as frustrating as those, you know, dial in services where, you know, please press one if you want this kind of thing, right? It's a much more seamless, natural experience. And now that you can even read and interact with it, speak back and forth and have it read back to you. Okay, so what's in it for you? Um, some of the big applications, of course, are gonna be data analysis and forecasting. Uh, unless you're on Wall Street or you're doing those kinds of things with, with money management, 
this kind of data analysis probably isn't terribly useful for you, but content creation, whatever your business is, probably is very meaningful, right? You've probably had somebody tell you, or if you go to one of the other workshops, you're gonna have somebody tell you how important it is to make sure that you're creating content on a regular basis, that's high quality, that you're getting in front of people all the time. Because well, search engines don't wanna just have a static website. They're not gonna put you high in results if you just make a website 10 years ago and never touch it. Um, AI detection is kind of an interesting one too. And perhaps ironically, I myself am not particularly interested in reading AI generated content. I value human thought and human writing and, and my fellow human creators. So it's useful to me to be able to detect whether or not I can, you can generally tell by reading it, let's be honest. And while it will probably get better, it's still always going to be a little off, right? So it can be kind of useful to use AI detectors and see, okay, well, you know, did somebody really do this? Or if you're a teacher, did my student write their paper using AI? Personal assistants, I kind of mentioned uh, the, the chat box would be a lot like that. But this is something I've been using a lot more recently. And as long as I'm doing well on time, I'm going to shoot, I'm going to show you uh, one of the more recent versions of the app that came out for ChatGPT, where you can really talk back and forth with it. The delay is next to nothing. It's actually a genuinely useful experience that I might actually really start using it because I can get information in faster than I can type and get better information right away. Optical character recognition is an example of a technology that's been around for many decades. This is, it's called OCR. This is when you scan something like a PDF and you can have it converted into text and you can actually search and read and alter it and all those kinds of things. So you've probably already used that quite a bit. And I mentioned chat chatbots already. Knowledge base is special because you can tailor these bots to draw specifically from information that you supply to it. So if you're trying to create a chatbot experience on your website and you want somebody, somebody to be able to ask questions about all your products and services and what are your hours and all of these kinds of things, it actually has crawled your website and any other documentation that you gave it and it's formulating its responses based on your specific information. So you're not dealing with this sort of overgeneralized stuff that you're gonna get with something like generic chat sheet. So I put a lot of things on uh, this sheet that I gave you. And, you know, like I said, there's probably already 20 new AI companies since I started this. Okay. So there's a lot on here that might even already be obsolete. In fact, I know that they're talking about Google Bard. And Bard isn't called Bard anymore. It's called Gemini. So these things become obsolete really quickly. But um, I did put up a few here that I, that I found a little bit more recently that could be particularly interesting for you. Um, I'm going to spend some time with ChatGPT. That's a little bit like saying Kleenex now, right? Um, it's, it's got so much brand recognition that we sort of associate that with chatbots, but it's really just one particular company. There are quite a few. Um, Claude is free and particularly good at sounding a little bit more human, a little bit more personalized. Uh, Gemini is Google trying to catch up and they were doing a really, really great job until GPT-4 Omni came out last week. Um, Jasper's really great for like marketing and content writing, um, copy AI again for, for marketing. So there are a lot of techniques that have been developed using what we call the foundational models like ChatGPT or Gemini, and then they fine tune them, meaning they train a little bit extra. Think of it like grad school for these, for these models so that they can be very well suited to particular kinds of tasks. Um, on the image side of things, Stable Diffusion is a really interesting product. It can also do things with audio and video. Um, Dolly is one I'm actually gonna show you a little bit. That's part of uh, one of OpenAI's product. Midjourney is arguably one of the better ones. Um, they, they have some weird little flukes about them. Like you'll, you'll get images where people have three fingers or they're spliced in some way. Or like if you try to use Adobe Firefly and you want text in your image, it, it doesn't understand how to spell. It just makes up words. So there are all kinds of weird limitations about all of these and reasons why you might choose one over the other. Um, some interesting ones that I think could be really interesting for some of you in here if you want to generate presentations. So there's AI where you can prompt and it'll create the pre presentation for you, either based on your content or you just tell it the subject matter and let it go and it actually comes up with everything for you on the fly. Could be kind of cool. Um, on the video side of thing, I'm going to hopefully be able to show you a couple of these. Opus Clip is a really great one for taking long form video content. So say, for example, this presentation, I could take this presentation and chop it into maybe 30 second, one minute, 90 second little blocks that I can post on social media. So with minimal effort for me, I can create weeks worth of, of social media content to post. Um, Visla uh, is a really interesting one where you can create videos on the fly and it uses stock video. So it doesn't necessarily look super weird 
the way some of these image generation algorithms might work. It's using stock video that already exists. You tell it the subject matter and it creates a script, it creates a voiceover and creates a video for you. Um, Sora is something that there's been a lot of buzz about. I don't know if you've heard. It's on the horizon. It's only been released to some beta testers, basically. But this is supposed to be an extremely accurate and sophisticated video generation to the point that it has a lot of people in Hollywood pretty nervous. Oops, shouldn't have gone too far. Um, really interesting one for any of you who do podcasting, you have a Lidu, which will help do things like edit out the spaces, the ums, the ahs, weird sounds that happen, breath noises, that kind of stuff, make it way easier for you to edit your podcasts. Um, clean voice, voice. Clean Voice AI does something very similar. So thanks to really save time on the editing side of things, which can help you get your content to your people faster. And then on the note-taking side of things, um, I personally use Fathom quite a bit. That's one where you can invite it to all of your online meetings. There are quite a few like these. This is by no means an exhaustive list. But what I like about this one is that you invite it, it becomes a guest to the meeting, it listens and transcribes everything, and in my opinion, does it better than a lot of the built-in ones for Zoom and Team. And then it'll give you a top line summary. You can email it out to everybody. It says, you know, here's your action items. Here's the things you talked about. Here's what you need to do next. Really great tool, I think. Um, there's Notion AI, which is really great for note taking. Rewind, I haven't had a chance to play with it yet, but apparently what it does is it keeps track of like maybe all the sites that you've been visiting, the documents that you've been opening. If you're doing research throughout the day, you've looked at so much stuff and you forgot, man, what was all that stuff I looked at? I know I saw this one thing over, but I can't remember where it was. It's keeping track and kind of similar to Fathom, is going to summarize everything for you. And then you can ask it questions like, OK, what was that thing about this one subject? And I'll say, oh, here it is, right over here. So could be really interesting if you find yourself doing a lot of browsing and research throughout the day. All right. So I'm going to show you a couple of things here. And actually, one of the first things I want to show you actually has to do with PowerPoint here. I wouldn't say this is overly sophisticated AI, but it is technically AI. I don't know if any of you have ever used the designer in PowerPoint, right? So this is a way where you can put in your information. Maybe you throw in an image or something. You're not, oh, sorry, it's not. All right, so you put in your information, and uh, you don't necessarily have a great idea for your colors or your layout or whatever, and it'll give you lots of suggestions over here, right? So this is an example of something that's built into a lot of it. That's something you're going to start seeing a lot more. It's not necessarily that AI is going to change all that much what it can do, that there's going to be all that many new things that it can do coming on, but you're going to start to see a lot of software providers integrating it into what they're doing. So you can actually have it generate text on the fly when you're working in your application, or you can have it do different layouts for you. Um, I'm going to mention ChatGPT now. and. Um, the good thing about advancements in technology, OpenAI is basically committed to their older versions becoming free. So right now you can use ChatGPT 3.5, which is quite sophisticated, quite a bit more sophisticated than three, and you can use it for free. And up until yesterday, that's generally all I would use. I didn't bother paying for the high version because I don't use AI specifically for research. You have to be really careful about that, especially with 3.5. The data cutoff for this was in 2021. So you can't ask it anything about current events. Well, here comes along GPT-4, and they enabled it to go search the internet. So now you actually can ask it about current events, but you have to work a little harder to do it. Last week, right, things changed so fast in this world, they came out with GPT-4 Omni. This does talk about current events. I can actually say things like, what happened in the world yesterday? The other thing is it's lightning fast. If any of you have used GPT recently, you've probably suffered that two to three second delay before it starts doing something. And then it takes a really long time to scroll its way through. This algorithm is so much faster, it's quite crazy. So this is a little long winded. I can say, you know, simplify this, explain it like I'm, oops. I can stop it. Now it's going to go do its thing. And I'm going to say, explain it like I'm eight, <laughs> right? <laughs> now, this is something that could be really useful for you. So you might be creating copy for a page that you or a blog article that you're doing for your website. And you're going to start with your first draft. I would recommend that you never roll with your first draft coming out of AI, right? This is a process. This is a tool. You're going to use it to brainstorm. You're going to use it to get page words on the paper, right? A lot of writers will tell you the hardest thing is getting it started, getting that first draft. 
Well, this can be tremendously helpful, right? I could say things like, I want to write an article on the implications of AI in SEO, right? And it's going to maybe give me some ideas. It's actually, in this case, writing the whole paper for me. Just kind of got some bullet points out. Um, these are some things that I might want to talk about. But I did this, and I realized, you know, this is a little bit too generic for my, for my AI article. So I'm going to let it finish, but I'm going to say, pick one of these topics and expand on it. All right, so this is going to be part of that process. I even, as a curiosity when I was preparing for today, uh, typed in, you know, I need to do a presentation on AI. What should I talk about? And there were five or six responses, and they were very generic, right? So I could have rolled with that. I could have given you that presentation, but I thought it was a little boring. So I, if I was going to continue with that line of reasoning to actually prepare my presentation, I would have done a process kind of like this and said, okay, I like this topic. Let's expand a little bit more on that. Or you didn't mention this. Let's try it this other way. And you may notice I'm talking to it like it's a person. I don't believe it's a person. It's not a person. That Google engineer a couple of years ago who said it was alive was totally wrong, didn't know what he was talking about. But it's very effective based on the way you communicate with it. So garbage in, garbage out. If you're very clear about what you want, if you communicate what you want clearly, then you're going to get a much different and probably better result. And this is going to definitely be a process. So to plug one of my fellow speakers, um, AI could be really useful for creating content, especially if you've created on the fly and you, know, you can't afford to have a content generator, all those kinds of things. But it's going to be part of a process. And at the end, you're still going to need to go over it and really make it sound like you, really refine some things. Because down the road, Google might start suppressing AI-generated content in search results. Right? It's going to value quality of content. It's going to value human content. I think we all should value human content. So, you know, a year ago they said, ah, it's fine, whatever, no big deal. Now they're already starting to say, mm, emphasis is on quality. We're going to start pushing some of those things down. And it could be that at some point regulations come along where they're forced to. So just be aware of that. AI should probably be part of a process. It should not be your entire process. Um, one other thing I want to do, I don't have time to go through them all, but um, over here on the left-hand side, you can see I've got all of these little icon shortcuts. These are called GPTs, meaning that they are third-party people that have created uh, products around, based around the GPT model, but they fine-tuned it. So, for example, there's one that's specifically for creating Excel documents. The one I really want to show you, though, is Canva. This is kind of slick, right? Make me a social media post or Instagram about... The fact that summer is around the corner. So you're actually in Canva. You're not in Chat. I'm in Chat GPT, and I'm using a Canva GPT. Uh, they used to call them plugins. They're not called plugins anymore. They're called GPTs. So what it's going to do is it's going to first of all ask me, do I want to allow it to connect to Canva? Oh no, because I'm being too large. Fine. Um, somebody want to give me something I should post online? Huh? You're at the team event. Yeah. With a selfie with a team member. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, make so, an Instagram. Pardon me. The property is what you call working in and using for plugins. You have to have the paid check. That's right. Yeah. So at this point, I do have the paid version. The plugins themselves did not cost me anything, but I had to have the pro license in order to use it. Yeah. Probably just the pro license. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think they have a lower tier. They have one for teams where it's like 19 a person, I think. So, and then we didn't hear what they said. How much is it? Roughly 19, a like year? 19 a person. No, per month. Yeah. And then you can do the right, the teams. One. I think, yeah, yeah, right, right. So, and then some of these um, that I started playing around with, once you start working with them, then they ask you for money after the fact, right? But Canva, I, I happen to have a pro Canva license as well about attending the team big event today. We'll see what it comes up with. Um, I'm hoping it works because I really want to show you the fact that it creates it, but then you can go open it and edit it in Canva, right? So Canva doesn't have this feature right now where I can tell it, make me this graphic here, and it does it directly in Canva. It gives you like some suggestions and some templates, right? This will actually create the post for you. Keep your text to five words. Oh, really? Yeah. All right. And yeah, it makes it hard. Big event today. Yeah, I guess. Post today. Yeah, it's, it's anywhere to post it. Yeah, well, it's those connected to Canvas, Canvas Limited. 
how it does it. Okay. Okay. Could have sworn I used more than five words yesterday when I was playing with it. Whatever. You get the idea. Take my word for it. You're gonna get you're gonna get a little picture. You're gonna get a link to go edit it in Canva, and there it is, and now you can go mess with it the way you would. I could see that being tremendously useful to you. Speaking of Canva, um, you can do kind of interesting things in here, right? I mentioned that what you're gonna see more and more is a lot of companies incorporating AI into what they do, right? So I can taste something like this little presentation here. Everybody loves animals, right? So here we go. And I could do something like I could edit the image and I could say, we're going to come on and load now. It's working off my phone, so. You just push inspire me and it will just do its own thing? Yeah, like I can create a, a, a brand new image. I can upscale images. I can erase things. I can take out the background. I can do all kinds of stuff. That's all AI. Do right? you type it in there? Erase background? Um, you don't type it. In this case, I would choose background remover, okay. which won't really be effective in this case because there already is, there already yeah. isn't a background, yeah. right? but I could remove that. The magic eraser is really interesting. So let me see if I can erase his tongue. Um, The example I normally use is one that has like writing. So it's like somebody's palm out and there's they're holding a piece of cardboard and there's writing on it. Well, I want to write something else there. So I can use the magic eraser and write or remove the writing. It fills it in with just blank cardboard and now I can write something over the top of it. Let's see what happens. <laughs> right? So case in point, that reality doesn't always match up to the height, right? I wouldn't say this is particularly great. I probably wouldn't roll with this. There are other applications that would do this a little better. So for example, I could go back to GPT and I could go down to Dolly. Dolly is an image generator. So I can say, make me an image of a wizard. Might take a little while. Image generators are definitely gonna take quite a bit longer. Some of them like mid journey, you'll actually see it start as this kind of fuzzy amorphous image and it sort of gradually starts to crystallize into something a little bit more generic. I use mid journey um, specifically for creating things like patterns. So there's something called tiling where I'll have an image that I want to replicate across as a, maybe a background on a website, right? Dumbledore. Right. Okay. But now I could come over here to something like, where go? Where are you? Drat. Okay. Um, make it as though they are attending Woodstock. <laughs> right. So I can do silly little things like this. Um, one thing that might be concerning to you, I know when, when ChatGPT first came out, my thought was, man, I feel bad for the content writers. Their industry has just been eliminated, right? But the truth is, again, reality doesn't quite match up to the hype. And now a lot of content writers have incorporated it into what they do. I suspect that means that I'm running out of time. So, so anyway, thank you so much. I appreciate you nerding out with me a little bit, and I'll be a little bit with you.